Five Nights at the Chum Bucket is a game almost every FNAF fan has seen or heard before. Whether you watch Markiplier play it as a kid or have played it yourself, there's no doubt that it's a popular game in the FNAF community. You would think the sequel to the game would be just as popular if not more from just the name alone, however, this is just not the case. There seems to be way less videos made about Krusty Krab 3 than Chum Bucket. It even has way less Game Joel followers than Chum Bucket, having around 5,000 less. Why does this game not receive enough care as Chum Bucket did? Is it worse than Chum Bucket? Is it really that bad? Well, to get things started, the sequel is not worse than Five Nights at the Chum Bucket. In fact, this might be the most underrated FNAF fan game of all time. Today, I'm discussing Five Nights at the Krusty Krab Chapter 3. First off, I want to say how visually fantastic this game looks, not just compared to Chum Bucket, but in general. I see the developer has really improved their skills over time after the second game. This game definitely looks very modern, I gotta say. This game came out only two years ago and seven years after Five Nights at the Chum Bucket, aka Five Nights at the Krusty Krab 2. I can say this game was definitely worth the wait. I'm sad that I never got to meet you in person. Not under good circumstances at least. Once we press new game, an intro cutscene plays of us waking up in the location we're playing in with Hammerhead talking villain-like. Apparently we're playing in a nuclear power station, which is a strange setting for a FNAF fan game. Right after that cutscene, we're thrown into the game. It's dark in the office from the lack of power, which we need to replace the fuses on the back wall to turn the power back on. This game's main mechanics are the power and the cooling. Multiple times throughout the night, we will have to turn off the power by flipping the switch on the back wall. By flipping the switch, the lights in our office turn off and our power quickly rises. When it's flipped on, the power slowly drains. There are also different yellow flaps we can switch on and off like the cameras and the hall lights. By turning these off, we can save power, but the only ones we actually need to flip is the coolant. There's a temperature meter that slowly rises and if it gets too high, Sandy will jump scare us. However, if we flip on the coolant, then the temperature will lower. This all seems a little overwhelming for new players because there isn't really a phone guide to tell you what to do, you kinda just have to figure it out, which is one of the only flaws that happens in this game. There are two monitors on the desk which display the cameras, and we just have to check cam 7A and 7B, which are our hallways. The two animatronics featured on this night, Hammerhead and the Amalgam, which I just call Patrick because that's what he looks like, both can come through either hallway or even two in the same hallway, which you can keep them away by using the hall light on either side of the room, which is a big red button. After some crusty crabbing, we reach 6 a.m. on night one, and then we start night two. On night two, we see three new animatronics, Squidward, Plankton, and the Phantoms. For Squidward, he'll make loud banging from the vents, and you'll have to turn around quickly and switch off the lights. If you don't, an exposure meter, similar to one night at Flumpty's 2, will rise. If it reaches its max, Squidward will scream at you and you will die. For Plankton, you'll need to find him and click on him similar to Munch Jr. from Chuck E. Cheese's Rebooted. If you don't click on him, he will take either your fuses or he will just take your tape player, which you don't want. The Phantoms are where things go silly. If the tape player is off, which it shouldn't as long as you deal with Plankton, every time you turn around a new Phantom will appear. If all three are there at once, you die. If you somehow die, stay seated for the silliest jump scare in gaming. Anyway, after dealing with Spongebob and friends a second time, 
We reached 6 a.m. and continued to night 3. On night 3, only one new animatronic appears to ruin our day, and that is Sandy. We have to constantly check cam 03 to see if she's there. If she does appear there, we gotta nuke her with the red button. This will break our power, so now we have to use a fuse from the drawer under our desk to replace the broken one, keeping our power off. After dealing with the Sponge Gang's BS yet again, we continue to night four. Now I'm not gonna discuss night four because that's just a faster paced version of night three. So let's move on to the dreaded night five. Night five is where the game gets serious. Squidward's head falls onto the desk, you know, normal stuff. And then an exposure meter appears. Hammerhead from nights one through four and the phantoms from nights two through four are the only ones on this night. But be careful, because Hammerhead is on steroids on this night, and is at your doorway less than every 20 seconds. Sometimes, instead of being at your door, he can appear in Cam 03, like Sandy, but then you'll have to nuke him with the button as well. He can also appear in the vents, making you need to turn off the lights as well, just like Squidward, which is dead right now. After six minutes of torture, we reach 6 a.m. and we get the nice ending. After beating Night 5, we are met with our main protagonist monologuing about his life after Five Nights at the Krusty Krab 3, Night 5. Of course, accompanied with a set of stock footage. I really liked this ending because in the last game, it left off with a cliffhanger of some guy emoting on the ground with Squidward watching over him. But in this one, it really has a good sense of closure, unlike a lot of fan games where they usually have some sort of cryptic ending where it usually hints towards another game. You can tell this is the last game in the series. However, this is not technically the end because we still have to beat the three extra modes unlocked after beating the game. We unlock Nightmare Night, which is a harder version of Night 5 but we have to deal with Plankton as well. We also unlock Challenge Night, which is a harder version of Night 4, but everyone is on steroids. If you beat both these modes, you will unlock Custom Night, and guess what? It's a custom night. Wow. Beating this 720 mode unlocks you with a Golden Star monitor on the title screen. This game was truly a masterpiece that many people forgot about or didn't notice. The gameplay was very smooth and everything flowed together so well. Unlike the second game, or especially the first game, this might be my favorite fan game. If I had to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd rate it 9 out of 10 Planktons, and I only rated it 9 out of 10 because there wasn't really a phone guy to help guide the player. The people who did play this game found it very difficult, however, I did not. I feel like this was probably equal difficulty to Five Nights at Candy's Remastered, especially the custom night. Anyway, that's all from me for today. If you want to see more FNAF content like this one, make sure you subscribe because it helps motivate me to make more content like this one and put more effort into it. Anyway, bye bye.